I would like to welcome up our next speaker. He is the author of multiple books on leadership and culture. He served as the CIO of the U.S. Citizenship and Integration Services in DHS, where he spurred the adoption of things like cloud computing, DevOps, Agile, continuous deployment, many of the other things on which we base today's digital government. Uh, he's currently an enterprise strategist at Amazon Web Services, an expert on technical culture in the uh, leadership culture in the public sector. And I love the title of your talk, Mark, drawing <laughs> from the delicate art of bureaucracy. Tell us more about monkeys, razors, and sumo wrestlers. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why it's not clear to you and to everybody else. We're, we're talking about bureaucracy. And clearly the way to fight a bureaucracy is by using the monkey, the razor, and the sumo wrestler. But just in case it's not as obvious to everybody else, I did write a book about it. So bureaucracy is this fascinating thing. I, I know it doesn't sound that way at first, but bureaucracy, first of all, is, a, is deeply embedded in quite a lot of the things that we do. At the same time, we, we seem to have this hatred for it. You know, there's uh, bureaucracy makes us uncomfortable. It, it uh, makes us feel those sort of existential, I don't know, dread and anguish. Where actually it's, at least in, in its most technical sense, it's a way of structuring work, that's all. It's a way of organizing such that there are rigid rules formally written down and there are rigid roles and authorities formally written down. And that's what it is. And it's in some cases useful and in some cases not useful. But especially today when we're trying to transform digitally and we're trying to become fast and nimble and all of those things, Bureaucracy seems to get in the way quite a lot. Well, to, um, not, so, not to put too fine a point on it, Mark, but you did call it an often soul-shattering, frustrating, <laughs> Kafka-esque nightmare. So yeah, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> well, I was the CIO of a government agency, and it seemed that bureaucracy was in the way of everything I tried to do. And, and I think, you know, a lot of people find that. So it seemed important to me to address this question of what do you do when, when bureaucracy is in your way, when you're trying to become nimble and fast and, you know, do DevOps and all these other things, how do you address that bureaucracy without this horrible hatred welling up in you, getting in your way? So digital is a new thing. And I mean, not to some of us, but in government and public sector, but it seems to me like things that were hard are now easy and things that were easy are now hard. I mean, Jeff just gave a great example of like, uh, who are you? was a pretty easy question when the person was right in front of you and you could sort of type, take a piece of the DNA or something. So authenticity, is this, is this piece of news fake or real? Is this video retouched or authentic? That was pretty easy in the physical world. It's very difficult as we're learning today in the, in the virtual world. But on the other hand, personalization, right? Like if you wanted a custom newsletter created just for you every day, that would have been very expensive. And now we all get one for free tuned to our likes on every social platform. So how will bureaucracies cope with this shift to what's now cheap and what's now expensive? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, Jeff convinced me thoroughly that that is a hard problem to solve. Engineer resolution. People were like, why would you start a leadership day with weeds? And I'm like, you have yeah. to see these weeds because you can't build on them. Ouch, ouch. Well, I, I, I think bureaucracy tends to take on certain characteristics that are not in the inherent part of bureaucracy. And that it's those characteristics that tend to get in our way when we're, when we're impeded by it. So I think the, the way to make bureaucracies adjust is to essentially wipe away these, these three characteristics that I, that I identify in the book. The three are bureaucracies often, they're bloated rather than lean. And I mean that in a very specific way. I mean, you know, lean in the sense of lean manufacturing, lean Six Sigma and so on. Bureaucracies have waste where they don't need to. The second thing is bureaucracies tend to petrify. They don't alter their rules and their, and their authorities as things change around them. And then the third thing is that they, they tend to become coercive rather than empowering or enabling. And it's those three things that are the things that are really in the way. And it's those three things that drive us crazy and make us hate bureaucracy, but they're not essential characteristics. And in fact, there are a lot of models out there of how you can make a bureaucracy leaner how you can make it enabling rather than coercive and how you can make it learning with feedback loops. So I think that's the key to becoming digital and yet coping with bureaucracy that might be in place.
So tell me about sumo wrestlers and monkeys and razors, because those all sound like different. When I first saw that title, I thought this feels like Kung Fu Panda, right? Like I'm going to do <laughs> razor style or sumo style. Who's your adversary and, and what are those three stances for? Well, so if a bureaucracy is in your way and you know you're trying to do the right thing and the bureaucracy is, is stopping you from doing it, then rather than go into this hate mode and panic mode and existential dread mode, there are things you can do. And they're along the lines of trying to change those three characteristics. So in my book, I propose about 30 plays, I call them, 30 things you might do to try to get the bureaucracy out of your way, which might mean changing the bureaucracy or sidestepping it or whatever it is in, in the case. And those 30 plays or so divide themselves neatly into plays that are executed by three different personas. So I call them the persona of the monkey, the razor, and the sumo wrestler. So the monkey has about 10 plays. The essence of the monkey is to be provocative, essentially, to be mischievous and provocative, and to use provocation as a way to learn. You might say provoke and observe is the principle. You know, you try something, see what happens, you learn about the bureaucracy, and then you adjust. The, Sounds very much like the, the Boyd sort of oodle loop idea of try a little thing and then iterate quickly, right? Yes, and see what you can get away with, you know? So is the <laughs> monkey, is, 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 is fast cycle time like an essential component of that monkey strategy? Uh, it, it can be. So, for example, we found USCIS, we were far, forced to write a ton of documentation that didn't seem to add a lot of value. So the monkey move was to just write shorter pieces of documentation. You know, there was nothing in the rules that said you couldn't do it, where a question was asked, instead of writing a 10 page answer, write a two sentence answer and see what happens. <laughs> uh, if, if it, as long as the two sentence answer actually covers the important material. Right. And it turned out, uh, nothing happened. You know, actually the people who read it were happy. <laughs> so that's classic monkey, right? The razor is the tool of becoming lean. It refers to trimming away the fat, but it also invokes uh, Occam's razor, the medieval philosopher Occam, who essentially said, he didn't exactly say this, but he's credited with saying something like simpler explanations are better than more complicated explanations. So I said, there should be a bureaucratic Occam's razor that says uh, bureaucratic processes and practices, the, the simplest one that accomplishes what you're trying to accomplish is the best one. And so the razor has about 10 plays as well that all involve, you know, trimming away fat. That brings us to the sumo wrestler, who's my favorite personality. If you've ever, I, I lived in Japan for a year and, and it's hard to live in Japan for, for a while without becoming a fan of sumo. It's, it's just brilliant. And <laughs> the, the thing that makes it so interesting is you've got these two really, you know, big, powerful forces and they collide into each other. And the object of the, of the game is to push your opponent out of this little ring you're in or make him hit the ground with something other than his feet. Now, the thing is, if you have two massive people and they collide with each other and they push at each other, you're, you're going to have sort of a, you know, tension there. You're going to have a, a stasis. Now, if you push harder than your opponent, you're going to push them out of the ring. But if you push harder than your opponent and your opponent yields a little bit, you're going to go flying out of the ring. Right. So in a way, this is about using your opponent's strength against them. And that's how you, that's how you win in a way. So in the fight against a bureaucracy, the principle is to use bureaucracy against itself. And we did that very successfully. In fact, I can tell you the quick story of our fight against a big bureaucratic thing called MD 102, Management Directive 102. And one of our solutions to fighting, I don't want to use the word fighting, struggling against it, let's say, was to release our own policy. We called it MI-CIS-003. And it essentially said, do things this other way, not the way it says in MD-102. And because it was documented and it was official looking, that meant that the auditor were going to compare our behavior against it. And they're going to say, ah, great. You're doing exactly what it says on the paper. That's, that's wonderful. No. So, that's the sumo wrestler for you. 
So we just heard from Jeff Jonas, and I didn't know there was going to be a mention of serverless computing in there, but it was obviously nice to see the Amazon stuff in that. And I talked to DJ Patil, and we're actually going to be screening that conversation on Friday. And he talks about the U.S. COVID response and the work that he did with Werner at Amazon to, and the team to get the generation of computing models from seven days down to 30 minutes. And just to put that in context, if you have new information about pandemic response, like the percentage of people that are choosing to wear masks, and you need to update that. It used to take seven days to compute the new predictions. And then you get that down to 30 minutes, you can obviously change how that's working. Have people really internalized the sort of pay by the drink model of computing when they are trying to enact government policies? Because it seems to me like you wrote a competing policy and you were able to say, hey, I have these two policies, use this one. And people said, okay. but are, are, it doesn't feel like everyone's going through their old policies and saying this one's now completely wrong because of the new factors of what it costs to do something and how easy experimentation is and stuff like that. How do we get uh, digital? How do we get government leaders, especially in a time where they're overwhelmed with pandemic response, to take a step back and go, "I got to look at these policies because they're nonsense in this new reality." <laughs> yeah, that's that's the issue, isn't it? That's that's really the big question. So. It's tempting to look at the cloud as just a way to have somebody else run your infrastructure, right? It, it is that on a certain level, or it, or it seems that way. But the, the truth is that the cloud is a game changer. It really changes what we're able to do, how we're able to do it, and changes it in a really deep way that the more you think about it, the more surprising it is. I, I, sometimes I think of it like the, the public utilities that generate electricity, right? The cloud is a way to get compute power, just like the electrical grid is a way to get electrical power. Now, when the electrical grid was in place and you could just plug things into a, a socket in your wall, that was a huge game changer because all of a sudden people could, or companies could create appliances. And as long as it plugged into the wall, you could have a blender, you could have a toaster, you could have uh, an air conditioner, I don't know, you could have all these things that weren't really possible before. And I think the cloud is that kind of thing, as Jeff said, with serverless, for example. We, we use it for all kinds of social good efforts. And our customers, many of them do as well, the nonprofits and the governments that are using AWS. Just as an example, we have a disaster response team within AWS that goes to the scene of major disasters like flooding and wildfires and things like that and helps the local governments and the nonprofits that are trying to cope with it and helps them get, you know, connectivity back and, and save people and accomplish their missions. So for example, if they show up at a flood, they might bring uh, an Amazon snowball or compute at the edge device, and they might have it preloaded with maps of the area. And then they can fly drones over the flooding and take the information and correspond it with what's on the map and figure out where they need to go to rescue people and things like that, right? These are things that, you know, it, it would have been hard to do before, but now with the cloud, in a way, it's it's kind of routine. You know, we can just do these things as if it's natural. We just have what we need at our fingertips. So how do we get governments to see that? Well, I, th I think if for everybody, even for large companies, it's the same challenge. It takes a little while to get the thinking going and to see what the possibilities are. And some of it is watching what others are doing with the cloud and generating ideas based on that. So Mark, also, but you're, uh, I want to cut you off just for a second. Yeah, yeah, you sure. give me flashbacks here <laughs> um, because there was a book by Nick Carr called The Big Switch that talked about the switch from owning your machines to renting your machines. It was very low level. And I remember at the time, he uses this analogy of turning on the electrical grid. And I remember at the time, and this is like 10 years ago, that the, a lot of people, me included, said, hey, that analogy is kind of flawed because I don't care if you have my electrons. Like, I care on a billing level, but you're not going to impersonate me because you had electrons that were intended for me. Once upon a time, the ultimate gift everybody wanted for their wedding table was a, a mixer. You used to buy these big Hobart mixers, right? Giant mixer. And it came with like 40 attachments because the motor was expensive 
And so you bought one big motor for your kitchen and you could put in sausage grinders and bread kneaders and all these other things. And now wedding tables sort of grown under the arc of ubiquitous motors. There's the immersion blender and like all these other appliances, each of which has a, mo a motor in it. So to me, what's interesting and what's kind of missing from the, the electrical utility analogy is that it's not that all of a sudden everyone has electricity that you pay for with a meter. It's that now motors become cheap and abundant. In this case, to break my analogy, the motor is the compute. And so you no longer need one centralized system because that's the precious scarce thing. Now you have dozens of them. So like I would much rather have been an appliance salesman at the dawn of the electrical era than a utility. And so it seems to me like the real value in this is all of the new kinds of things that can be created that were not possible because computing is now ubiquitous. Uh, what are you most excited to see people building in the next couple of years? Oh, I, I really think, obviously we have a lot of let's say social problems that the world needs to deal with. And I think a lot of them are quite amenable to solutions that, that take advantage of the cloud and the compute power being readily available. In fact, if you look at the UN's 30 sustainable development goals, for example, there's so much there that solutions are, I wouldn't say easy to come by, but there's so much more possible to come by now that some of the heavy lifting, the hard stuff is kind of out of the way and you can just plug in and get your compute. So I think the possibilities in those areas are phenomenal. We've been looking in particular a lot at homelessness and what we can do about homelessness. Well, to, to a certain extent, it's a, it's a data problem, actually. For example, getting homeless exper people experiencing homelessness into permanent supportive housing. In some cases, it's a matter of getting their documentation together, getting it approved and so on. It's, it's more or less a data problem. So I'm really excited about those possibilities. Yeah, and I think one of the underlying messages we're going to keep hammering this week is that public servants work for a big tech company. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> uh, like, we really do. I mean, but if you wouldn't be comfortable leaving your current job and going to work at Amazon tomorrow, you have to realize that your job in the public sector is very quickly becoming that of a tech company. So thank you so much for sharing these uh, insights with us and really, really love the title of the book. Love that you've been able to take, you know, real lessons from the street. And again, this conference would absolutely not be possible without tremendous support from our partners around the world. And we're thrilled that you're able to join us. I'm sure you've got some other things to worry about today in the US. Uh, <laughs> so have a great day. Try not to scroll too much and I really appreciate you being a part of this. Great oh, to see thanks. you. My pleasure.